tired. Anybody else staying in the Sky Tower or is it just me? Sky Tower. So I was told that the walk from there to here is officially 6.8 miles. So if you've walked there and back, you are a half marathoner. So congratulations on that. If you've walked back twice, you are an elite athlete. So again, you guys are doing amazing things. So my name is Wes Wilson, and I have the pleasure and honor of being the MC for day three. Very exciting. We've had, to, had such a, a great week. On day one, we had Dr. Evan Adams as our, as our MC. We've had amazing things going on in the afternoon. Our keynote for yesterday was Miss Sutton King. In the afternoon, we had our poster presentation, and then, then last night we had our powwow. So we've had a jam-packed week. So again, we want to thank everybody for being able to be here and being with us this week. But at this time, of course, we, we always want to start in a good way, as we always do. So I've actually asked my partner in crime to come up and say, say a few words and to offer up our prayer, Mr. Nick Kwapipaw. Big round of applause. Big round of applause. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. If you are able, please stand with me and pray along with me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, bringing us this far. Lord, you saw fit to uh, uh, bring us all together at this place in Durant, Oklahoma. I ask for blessings upon all the people that you see here today, uh, everybody that's gathered, all the prayers that are being said to you right now in this group here, Lord, I ask that you hear those prayers, answer those prayers. Somebody right now here today is asking you for help, Lord. Something's heavy on their heart, heavy on their mind. Hear that prayer, Lord, and, and, and help them with whatever they're going through right now, Lord. Watch over our families that we leave at home as we try to work to improve the health of all American Indians and all of our people. I ask that you uh, uh, bless those people that we're working for, those tribes that we're working for, especially this Choctaw Nation who is our host here, Lord. I ask that you bless the staff of the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board, my work colleagues, uh, answer the prayers that they have for our workplace and, and our mission and our vision. And I ask that you... Uh, Bless all, all of our uh, American Indians who are dealing with uh, uh, health issues. Maybe they're dealing with uh, something that's uh, um, affecting their future and future generations. Help us all be, to be of one mind going forward to help each other and uh, make sure that uh, our kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids have a wonderful life and most of all, keep our culture alive. I give you praise and glory, Lord, and I thank you for all your blessings, and I ask that you bless everything else that we do here today and make sure that we all make it home safe. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Nick, for your kind words and your blessing. I can't think of a, of a better way to, to start our day and for us to be able to come together in, in prayer. Prayer is always good. We should pray often. So, I also have a few announcements that I, I, wanna, I would like to share with everybody. Just a, a, a gentle reminder that checkout, if you are leaving today, checkout is at 11 a.m. So please make sure that you have, have all of that mentioned. Or I wanted to be able to mention that for everyone so that way you would know. You know, this week we've had a lot of great things, lots of great laughs, lots of great smiles. It's so great to see everybody, to be able to come together because... This is the first time we've been able to have this conference in person, and it's been lots of hard work, lots of dedication. A lot of our great team has been able to come together to, to make this happen. And one of the things that Dr. Evan Adams had talked about was being able to come back into the circle and be able to find that. And I feel like this is such a great event with so many great folks that have been able to come together for this purpose. All of our folks, we were able to come together as public health professionals to come together and be able to learn, be able to talk about some of our new ideas, but also to be able to share some of our struggles because as we know, as we continue to work within, within, with, for our people, that we do have those struggles. But it is nice to see so many, so many of our professionals that can come together and spend, spend a few days. So again, I know there's several things that are going on at home. I know we always have family stuff. If we have kids, it's ball season. 
If you haven't paid your taxes, those are due, I believe, pretty quick. So again, that is my other gentle reminder. But this is such a great opportunity for us to be able to come together and share this time and be able to learn and be able to have all of these great things. So at this time, I would actually like to turn it over to our fearless leaders that have been working so hard for this conference to make sure everything is just right, being able to keep us on track, but also being able to tell me, hey, cut it off or keep going. So again, uh, so I'm, I'm so very thankful to be able to, ha to have these people. So at this time, I would like to invite our co-chairs for our conference, Ms. Lexi Hill and Mr. R.D. Dickens. Well, good morning and welcome and thank you so much for attending our 15th annual public health conference. Uh, man, this thing has grown so much and man, we just thank you for your attendance and coming and being part of this. Uh, we love putting this on. It's a lot of work, a lot of things and effort go into this. It's amazing. We spent a whole year for just a couple days to hang out with you guys, but we love doing it. We're glad to have you. And uh, <clears throat> I got a quote here. Uh, former NFL uh, coach and Super Bowl winner and NASCAR team winner, um, Joe Gibbs was asked, um, what was it, the similarities were by being at the top in both sports? And Joe Gibbs replied and said, one of the most important things that he found out throughout the whole process is you win with people. So at this time, <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity and honor our staff for all the work they do. First off, I'd like to recognize Ms. Lexi Hill for all her hard work. She's done a lot of heavy lifting and keeping us in line and keeping us on track. She's done an excellent job of that, so please give her a hand. Also, I'd like to recognize our SPTHB staff. If you are a staff here, please stand up. You guys make this possible. We cannot do this without you. Thank you for the MCs, everybody from, from top to bottom that has been involved, that has really contributed, stepped in and filled in the gaps when needed, and so thankful for them and all their efforts and putting up with us, having meeting after meeting after meeting to make sure everybody understands what's going on, clarifying everything. We're so thankful and we're just awesome. It's awesome to have you guys here and we're looking forward to seeing you guys in 2024. Thank you, RD. Uh, our sincerest Yaagos, Ahos, Miigwiches to everybody that came out and is able to be in community with us, you know, um, our theme this year is restoring health and uniting community, and it's just so timely, you know, we were trying to figure out what we, what can we do, what, what is our theme, you know, how can we bring people together, and after the last couple of years of just what's happened in our communities, we, we thought it was good to just, to just come back, you know, um, and, and really be intentional about what we're doing here, you know, there's only so much planning you can do, but you all are the ones that made this happen. So please give yourself a round of applause for just being here, being present, being available to all of the questions, the networking, the presentations. Uh, you guys are the ones that made this happen. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. This is one of our highest attended uh, tribal public health conferences ever. Uh, this is also my first in-person conference, so I'm just so excited to be here. I'm so excited that you are with us on this journey, and I hope that you guys will come back to your communities in a good way, and, you know, you've learned something here. You know, you were able to share, able to connect, and one of the things that, you know, <laughs> when I get smudged off, um, I always hear, I need to smudge your feet, so every step that you take is a prayer. And I hope that when you go out of here, every step, step that you take back to your communities is like a prayer. You carry what you learned here this, these last couple of days, and you take that, and you learn something, and you're able to maybe adapt something, ad make a change, you know, what th whatever that is. Um, we hope that you're able to go back to your communities just a little bit better than you came here. You know, and that's what we want to do. That's how we want to show up for you all. So... Just again, thank you so much to our staff. Thank you so much for, to Choctaw. 
Um, we just really, really appreciate you all being here. And uh, yeah, I'll go. Thank you. We, we're going to do some raffles. All right. Do we got some uh, raffle tickets to draw from? Don't get mad if you don't win. <laughs> and is this for the your conference admission next year? So we have two conference registrations and hotel stays for 2024, which is going to be at the Hard Rock Casino in Catoosa. Uh, so if you guys win this, just come up here, and Aaron will get your information, and we'll get you uh, registered for next year. All right, we got the number here, 509-7312. Last three, or, or last four, 7312. Do we got a winner? We got a winner? All right, come on down. Congratulations. We got our first attendant that will be there next year. Call it Feathers. All right, for the next one, for our next number is 509-7539. Anybody? Check your tickets. There we go. We All got right. another winner. I feel like the price is right. Come on down. <laughs> So congratulations to them. The next thing that we have is a Galaxy tablet uh, from Samsung, correct? Okay. And a cover. And a cover. All right. So you got protection for that. Knee. All right. Next number is 509-7515. Seven five one Ooh, five. We got a winner. <laughs> All right, there you go. Come on down. Congratulations. And I believe that might be the end of our raffles right now. Is that it? Oh, Nicole from Texas. Congratulations. Congratulations to our winners, and we yeah. hope to see all of you at the Hard Rock Casino next year in Catoosa. Um, there's our save the date. Yeah, right here. Yeah. So we hope to see you guys next year. Yeah, I'll go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Once again, let's give these guys a round of applause for all of their hard work, making sure everything is being done. They have been working extremely hard in addition to their other tasks. So again, thank you so much for all of your dedication and also for all of our staff that have, have been able to be here, having the long days, but still being here and smiling and being able to provide or make sure that we have the best possible conference. In regards to our raffles, I also wanted to mention we will have a couple more raffles this afternoon and we will have some raffles this afternoon for our gratitude ceremony. So we'll have some after our keynote, and we'll also have a few more this afternoon. And we will use the same tickets this morning, but when you come back for the, for the gratitude ceremony, you will get new tickets. So you can keep those. Our, the ones that you have today, if, if you didn't win, you still have some chances to win this morning, but then when you come back this afternoon, we will have new tickets. I was telling some of the, of the staff this morning that I actually was able to attend a conference and I was very excited about it and they were hyping up all of the raffles and all of the great things and they were like, we have a, a really special gift for us. So everyone's getting excited, like, oh, well, it's a, it's a car. We're giving away a car. I was like, oh man, this is awesome. They're like, well, it's, it's a red car. And I'm like, oh man, like, I'm a big OU fan, Boomer Sooner over here, and um, big OU fan, you know, like a red car, man, this would be awesome. And then, you know, you, you kind of begin to think, and like, it's a, it's a, a, a red Chevy car. All of the excitement and, you know, all of the anticipation, thinking about all the new cars that are coming out. 
that like it's a red Chevy Camaro. Like, oh man, I would love to win that. So of course I'm showing up and I'm very excited to have my ticket, has my name on it, I'm ready. I'm like, this is the one. And they actually called my number. And I was so excited. I was like, oh man, oh my gosh, I just won a car. I jumped out of my boots. I was so excited, ran up there to find out that it was a Hot Wheels car. So I did win a red Chevy Camaro, but it was a Hot Wheels car. So um, very excited. I still have that car. Um, low miles, so if, if anyone is interested in a red Chevy Camaro, low miles, mint condition, I, I, I definitely have those things. So also, I also wanted to mention, I, I have a, on a personal note, um, yesterday was a very exciting day for a lot of us. And uh, there was something that very special happened at, at the powwow. I don't know if anyone had a chance to see that. Our very own Mr. Alex Smith, he got on one knee and proposed to his girlfriend. So Alex, congratulations to you. I don't know if Miss Leanne is here, but definitely congratulations to her. This was something that he, he had, he had uh, I was very blessed that I got to be a, a part of that and kind of learn about that and be, see all of the excitement, seeing all of those things. And that, as being a married person, I, brother, I feel you. All, all of the ups and downs in addition to doing the conference, I don't know how you did it. But I'm, I'm very thankful for you and, and uh, very, very excited for you and uh, wish you guys nothing but the absolute best. So again, thank you for that. Up next, I would like to actually like to turn it over to our keynote speaker. So our keynote speaker today is Dr. Juliana Reese. She's a board certified family medicine physician with over 20 years experience in the primary care. She's an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation and currently serves as the Director of Health, Healthy Tribes for the CDC National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health, Health Promotion Division of Population Health. So ladies and gentlemen, help me introduce Ms. Juliana, our Dr. Juliana Reese. I need a short people mic here, sorry. I need a box. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Wow, this is such an amazing experience to see everyone. I've, this is the first time I've been to this conference and I just wanna tell everyone how impressed I am with the coordination, the hospitality, the professionalism. It's just been an incredible experience for me and my staff from CDC and so thank you all. Thank you to the Choctaw Nation. Thank you to the Southern Plains Tribal Health Board and to all the individuals that helped to plan and coordinate this event. Um, very uh, outstanding job. Thank you so much. So I'd first like to begin with an introduction in Navajo, which is customary in my culture. Yat e bene, Juliana Reese in a shea, Hapaha Nishle, Senaha Bishni Bushishin, Kiaani e da shechedo, a shehi e da shenella, Seotso de Nasha, Akta, a son in a My name is Juliana Reese. I'm originally from Fort Defiance, Arizona, a small town on the Navajo Nation. Growing up on the reservation, I was fortunate to be heavily immersed in Navajo culture, language, and traditional ways. My parents were from different parts of the res, both traditional upbringings, but quite opposite in many ways. My mom was um, quite an introvert, uh, a big reader and an accountant, so everything had its order, had its way, uh, very calm and collected and kind of the type of person who um, likes to kill them with kindness, very forgiving and um, uh, focused. My father, um, on the other hand, was a, uh, basically a famous rodeo cowboy, and many of you from this area may remember Julian Martinez. Uh, we traveled up and down the nation, into Canada, into Mexico, all over the place rodeoing uh, growing up. He was a rodeo stock contractor as well, and so 
I had a life that was uh, wild and free and full of um, adventure, animals, um, probably a little bit of um, witnessed, witnessed a lot of whiskey drinking, fist fighting, and lots of charisma. Um, lots of humor, lots of love, lots of generosity. Um, so it was um, an upbringing that really brought together two different types of experiences uh, for, for my siblings and I. Although I witnessed the beauty and richness of my culture, I also experienced the re very real challenges of being American Indian in the, this society. I won't go deeply into my personal trauma, but I can say that I come from a home filled with contrasting experiences, a mix of unpredictability and stability, of calm and elation, of fear and security, of impulsivity and meticulous control, and of tragedy and joy. It was more acceptable to express anger than to show tears. There, was a sh there were strict rules, yet, fierce, yet a fierce challenge to break boundaries challenge authority, and see life as limitless. There was always work to do, rarely idle time, with an expectation of courage, toughness, excellence, and perseverance. Through all this, humor was pervasive. I always knew I was loved and cherished. I see now that having these two opposing themes in my life helped me to think of things more broadly and forced me to practice finding balance. At times, I felt there was little to no guidance, but things tended to work out. It wasn't until quite later in my life that I realized this was due to my traditional cultural values that were instilled in me from my family, my parents, my community, and my ancestors. I'm often asked what led me to a career in medicine and public health, and I must say it's a bit of an innate response, derived mostly from my Navajo cultural heritage. In Navajo, the concept of hojon is at the center of all that we continually strive for in life. It can be defined as balance, harmony, beauty, or even peace. This concept in many ways parallels the notion of equity. Equity and fairness are foundational elements for medicine and public health. This is what drives my passion. My public health journey has been deeply rooted in my Navajo traditional culture and my desire to improve health and wellness in American Indian and Alaska Native populations. It's been quite deliberately focused on building my skills to best serve American Indian and Alaska Native communities as effectively as possible. I've had the honor and the privilege of serving American Indian patients directly as a primary care physician, as an administrator, a mentor, and many in my hometown and other tribes across the nation. I continue to bring this knowledge and, and my life experience to the work that I do at CDC, promoting innovative ways to approach health and wellness, and supporting indigenous ways of knowing in this prestigious world of medicine and science. A lot of what I have learned over the years is realizing strengths and resilience factors in myself, my family, my community, and all indigenous people. I appreciated the words of Dr. Adams Tuesday when he talked about living excellently in two worlds. But how do we do this? How do we do this in a structure of a Western world? We draw from the knowledge that we have to design a framework for rebuilding our communities, supporting resilience, and reclaiming our health. I'm so very humbled to be here among such an impressive field of leaders and committed community leaders. I hope to share some words and some stories that will help illustrate my life experience as well as work to build our, quote, cultural perpetuity, as our sister Sutton King so graciously talked about yesterday. You've witnessed, my, you've witnessed very informative and powerful speakers this week. My hope is that you will gain knowledge, inspiration, and some ancestral energy to tell your truth, to build your community, and to reclaim your health. I have nothing to, to disclose financially, nor do I have any conflicts of interest to report. The objectives of this talk will include to describe the unique characteristics of tribal public health, to demonstrate the link between social determinants of health, historical trauma, intergenerational and multi-generational trauma, stress, and chronic disease in American and Indian Alaska Native populations. 
I'll give an overview of the CDC's Healthy Tribes Framework for Improving Health and Wellness in American Indian Alaska Native Populations. And I'll highlight lessons learned from the innovative work done at CDC incorporating vital community input. Before we launch into some of the pearls of wisdom we've gained by listening to the community, it's important to review a few historical facts that I will set the stage for understand that will set the stage for understanding health disparities of American Indian and Alaska Native populations and what makes them unique to the public health field. American Indian and Alaska Native tribes have had a long, complicated relationship with the U.S. federal government. Since the formation of the Union, Indian tribes have been recognized as sovereign nations by the United States. This has resulted in the transfer of land under treaties, contributing to the formation of the federal Indian relationship. Federal programs and services that benefit American Indian and Alaska Natives are based on this unique government-to-government -government relationship that is political and legal not race-based, like other ethnic groups in America. This government-to-government -government obligation is critical to understand because it forms the basis of the uniqueness of American Indian and Alaska Native populations with regard to public health and the challenges that tribes are faced with. There have been a number of distinct acts. Oh, I'm sorry, let me go back to this slide. There we go. There have, been another, another, there have been a number of distinct acts, policies, and laws enacted throughout history that have, been devastate, that have had devastating impacts on American Indian and Alaska Native communities. I'll do a brief overview of some of the more significant ones. I deliberately include these slides, these next few slides, not only for awareness, but for acknowledgement. Coming from a federal agency, it's imperative that this history be acknowledged as it plays a significant role in the health and in the healing of American Indian and Alaska Native populations and our surrounding communities. Then and only in, then can we begin to find ways to collaborate, establish trust in our efforts to support and rebuild our communities. In 1830, the Federal Indian Removal Act was implemented. This federal policy authorized President Jackson the right to make, quote, land exchanges by forcibly removing the five tribes Cherokee, Creek, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminole from their ancestral lands against their will. Over the next several decades, more than 40 tribes were removed from Indian country, an area that now comprises the entire state of Oklahoma. President Jackson rationalized the removal program as a benevolent effort that gave the American Indians one last chance to assimilate and, gave, and give up their culture. In President Andrew Jackson's address to Congress, he told lawmakers, quote, surrounded by our settlements, these Indians have neither the intelligence, the industry, the moral habits, nor the desire of improvement, which are essential to any favorable change in their condition. Established in the midst of another and a superior race, and without appreciating the causes of their inferiority or seeking to control them, they must necessarily yield to the force of circumstance and ere long disappear." End quote. This act set the stage for much more to come. In 1851, the U.S. Congress passed the Indian Appropriations Act, creating the reservation system to move Western tribes onto reservations. These reservations were established to make sure the remaining tribes converted to Christianity and became more Americanized. Within reservation borders, American Indians were not allowed to leave except by permission. Those who left were arrested and severely punished or killed. The federal policies were enforced by Indian agents which suppressed tribal culture and traditional activities. This resulted in overpopulation of reservation lands which caused food, in food insecurity and other issues. Many plants, game, and fish disappeared from overuse. In 1887, the General Allotment Act, or Dawes Act, was implemented, having disastrous effects on many tribes. This federal policy was designed to detribalize the American Indian by destroying the idea of communal land ownership on the reservations. Again, deliberately disrupting the community-based system so critical to American Indian Alaska Native people. Consequently, land owned by American Indians decreased from 
138 million acres in 1887 to 48 million acres in 1934. The Indian Reorganization Act, also known as the Wheeler-Howard Act, was signed by President Roosevelt on June 18, 1934. The law pushed tribes to adopt constitutions and city-style council governments by offering federal subsidies to tribes that adopted constitutions like that of the United States and replaced their governments with city council-style government structures. There was no consultation with tribes, resulting in the seeds for termination. In 1953, not very long ago, Congress passed another detrimental resolution beginning the federal policy of termination. In 1956, a companion policy of relocation moved Indians off reservations and into urban areas. Through these policies, the Bureau of Indian Affairs moved thousands of American Indians to cities, urban jobs, breaking family units, cultural ties, and familiar ways of life. The image in this slide shows an actual relocation brochure distributed to American Indians in the 1950s. The goal was to absorb American Indians into mainstream society and to deliberately place them in the most unfamiliar environments to rid them of their community connections and cultural ties. Although some American Indian and Alaska Natives chose to move off reservations to urban areas, 50% returned home to their families and reservations within five years because of the lack of job opportunities, education, and social services that were promised. The incidence of homelessness, poverty, substance use, sex trafficking and prostitution, trauma, death, and mental illness was staggering, and it was reintroduced back into American Indian, Alaska Native communities and perpetuated. Many American Indians stayed in the cities, creating the roots of the American Indian movement or AIM. Historical trauma for American Indians can be traced back hundreds of years to the onset of colonization, long before the formation of the Union even. Healthy, uh, historical trauma is often discredit, discredited as events in the distant past with minimal to no impact on current and future generations. This is absolutely untrue. Despite historical evidence of distant trauma, much, much of this trauma is quite recent and continues in both blatant and subtle forms. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart described much of this in her work. We can all imagine what life is like for our ancestors, but many of us, uh, but many of you do not need to look far to know these atrocities. My parents were both boarding school survivors. My mother was sent to Chicago during the Relocation Act with devastating experiences that forced her to escape, somehow finding her way back to the res. Many of our elders grew up in a time when the basic foundation of social life that bonded Native culture and communities together was damaged. This included language, values, ethics, and belief systems. Art, ceremonial objects, rituals, prayer, and healings were forbidden and condemned as a result. Many traditional practices were lost as a living part of American Indian culture. American Indian Alaska Natives lost the right to speak and learn our languages, sing our songs, learn from contact with elder knowledge, connect with nature, bond with our community, and pursue, tradi pursue traditional means of survival. The link between historical trauma and the disproportionate health disparities we see today in American Indian Alaska Native communities is evident, but the impact does not stop here. I'll highlight some recent events and circumstances that contribute and even amplify these health disparities, but also what we can do to combat them. You're all likely familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences um, screening form, the scoring system that tabulates the number of adverse childhood experiences and how American Indians and Alaska Natives show disproportionately higher scores at any age than the general population. This slide integrates adverse childhood experiences with adverse community environments, demonstrating how both set the stage for health outcomes. Essentially, in this depiction of social, this depiction is of the social determinants of health and the impact of the environment, showing how the roots directly affect the growth and development of this entire tree. For American Indian Alaska Native communities, some examples include the lack of access to potable water, multi-generational housing or lack of housing, lack of electricity, 
broadband, heating and plumbing, and transportation. Additionally, the siting of polluting industries on, on and near Indian country, the proportion of our population that is incarcerated in high-level facilities due to the structure of our judici judicial systems, the list goes on. For clinical care, it's even more complex due to the existing healthcare systems, IHS, tribal health facilities, urban Indian organizations that have been historically under-resourced and underfunded. These factors amplify the barriers for American Indian Alaska Native people. A side note to this slide, when you talk about the adverse childhood experience scale, you all know um, plenty of people in your communities and your environments who have had um, traumatic events and have lived through atrocities in their lives. And there are some kids that tend to just do very well and some kids that don't. And they could even be in the same family. There is another scale that is available called the Benevolent Childhood Experience Scale. And this gauges good things that um, children have around them in their environments. And you can have a child that scores incredibly high on an, for an ACE scale, but also scores high on a BCE or Benevolent Childhood Experience Scale. And those are the children that are resilient that tend to do well, that tend to, quote, make it. And so when you're thinking about ACE scores and you're thinking about struggles, um, think about the strengths and the positives and the resilience factors as well and try to balance those two elements if, if you have the opportunity. You've all, probably all seen this slide from one of our esteemed colleagues, Dr. Don Warren and his team. This slide is a bit busy, but, I'll really, but I really like it because it helps you better visualize the link between historical trauma and chronic disease. Not only does it incorporate historical trauma, but it includes present day stress at gestational, childhood, and adulthood periods of life. We all know adverse childhood experiences are a strong predictor of risk for numerous chronic and behavioral health conditions, including heart disease, diabetes, cancer, depression, suicide attempts, and tobacco substance use, but it, we don't often hear of the adult stress impacts. This graphic also includes how systematic efforts from external entities contributed to health disparities as they have historically led to high rates of formula feeding of infants and intake of high calorie, low nutritional value packaged and processed foods. All of these factors and social circumstances, including stress, affect health equity. It's important to understand how cycles of intergenerational and multi-generational trauma stemming from historical trauma form the basis of chronic diseases and disparities in, in American Indian communities. This reality was all too often apparent in my clinical practice. Many times patients would miss appointments or never seek out care due to the feelings of shame and guilt about having a chronic disease like diabetes, obesity, or even substance use. I spent the majority of my time talking to patients about historical trauma and the impact of stress on the body. People often felt they were some, that they somehow got diabetes because they were Indian or because of lifestyle choices that they made, like it was their fault. This picture was unclear in most of my patients' mind. The, the why behind the conditions wasn't apparent in many communities that I've worked in. I had patients come in apologetic about their blood sugar or their blood pressure, despite working extremely hard to change their lifestyle and taking their medications and just feeling constantly defeated. This, of course, affected me, and how can I do things differently? How can I approach this and help people understand why this is and what we can do to change? The most consistent system that was reported was stress. Financial stress, food insecurity, employment, feelings of inadequacy and homelessness or hopelessness. People were using substances, drugs, alcohol, commercial tobacco, and even food to cope. And they didn't understand how deeply rooted these urges and these cycles were. Imagine a young developing brain exposed to a traumatic event. What happens? Your body responds by releasing stress hormones, cortisol, and adrenaline, to name a couple designed to support your immediate physical response to that event, to run or to fight. These events are meant to be few and far between, so the hormone levels 
would typically return to the normal state. If you have continual stress, say an abusive environment, food insecurity, you're always on alert, always bathing your brains in chemicals that prepare you to run or to fight. Over time, the brain actually develops that way. Your body adjusts this environment and essentially resets itself as though this level of stress is the new normal. In medicine, it's called homeostasis. The body is amazing at figuring out how to balance and survive in whatever environment it's placed in, at least for as long as it can. We now understand that this stress is cumulative and affects the entire body. In fact, this trauma can affect your DNA, which means it can be genetically passed on. Now, the good news is that the body can change. It can change its set point in either direction. It can reset to a stressful environment, and it can reset to a non-stressful environment. There are essentially two cell types in the body that can regenerate. One is nerve tissue or brain tissue, and the other is liver. It, of course, depends on what's happening with your stress response and in your environment. The most promising change can happen in, in utero and in the developing brains of our youth, but this does not mean that all is lost for the adult population. This is our way to start reclaiming our health, but how do we do this in an environment that does not change? It's pretty impossible. Most of my patients were making tremendous efforts to eat healthy, but what does that mean? What is healthy? What does it look like in the context of a person's world? What are the food systems like? What are the connections to community? Most of my patients were so confused about food and how to change their lifestyle that this too was adding additional stress. The Western medical model has never evolved to see the comprehensive picture, but we have the power to change our communities and support comprehensive solutions by understanding why, the why behind it all. Now, most of what I talked about so far has been a quite negative, and although essential to acknowledge and understand, it's more important to also talk about community strengths and the protective factors that have contributed to our resilience and have allowed us to survive. Remembering the recurring themes of historical events I just reviewed, cultural erasure was one of the most prominent methods of assimilation and elimination of American Indian and Alaska Native populations. Why would this be? Likely because it is a powerful protective factor that fosters identity, connection, belonging, and ultimately survival. We know that cultural and cultural Culture and traditional practices are key factors in resilience and also pay a play a powerful role in wellness. It's not only about a single practice, but the values that these practices are based on. These are the elements we want to identify, support, enhance, and build upon to help American Indian and Alaska Native communities not only survive, but thrive. This brings me to talk about CDC's Healthy Tribes Framework but also a foundational component in incorporating tribal input, recipient input, and the community perspective is pivotal. The Healthy Tribes program includes a robust portfolio that funds tribes, tribal organizations, urban Indian organizations, and tribal epidemiology centers through three cooperative agreements. Tribal Epidemiology Center Public Health Infrastructure, or TECFI, is the first. Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country, or GWIC, is the second. And the third is Tribal Practices for Wellness in Indian Country, or TIPWIC. These cooperative agreements work synergistically to build upon and inform strategies to improve health outcomes across Indian Country by strengthening public health infrastructure, expanding the evidence base, and learning from innovative practices, including cultural traditions and tribal practices. These programs are designed to be strength-based, address community-identified needs with culturally appropriate methods that give scientific credibility to the practices that we have been, that have been present and utilized by American Indians and Alaska Natives for centuries. We utilize these key priority areas to support communities in fostering partnerships, informing and educating those involved, building a workforce, and enhancing data and surveillance as they implement solutions for themselves, for their own communities, after all, who was best at understanding the issues and dynamics of a community but the community itself? 
CDC has made innovative strides to improve, in, serve, to improve services to American Indian and Alaska Native populations. I'd speak to just a few that demonstrate how we listen to communities in various ways, directly from recipients, from official consultations to the Tribal Advisory Committee, and informally through meetings, webinars, and other opportunities. We are improving both our programs and the way we work with tribal communities. We take all of this community input into account, as well as lessons learned from our own work to enhance our programs and the way we as staff conduct our work. CDC is listening and we are committed to continuing innovation and improving our approaches. First, I'll start with a shift we made in the new Tribal Epidemiology Center Public Health Infrastructure Notice of Opportunity. No, sorry. First, we'll start with a shift we made in the new TechV NOFO that we feel better enables the techs to support the tribes they serve. Using learning from the first round of funding, we created more of a focus in this current round on how techs are not building not only building their own infrastructure, but also demonstrating how they are helping the tribes that they serve. Another example of gaining valuable knowledge to inform our work is a series of talking circles that we conducted to better serve tribal communities and recipients in the final two years of our Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country Cooperative Agreement. As you are aware, GWIC uses evidence-based activities to affect policies, systems, and environmental changes that support population-based health improvements across communities. The areas of focus are obesity prevention, commercial tobacco cessation and prevention, diabetes prevention, and heart disease and stroke prevention. This work is being conducted across the country through 16 Component 1 awards which fund tribes and urban Indian organizations, 11 awards which fund tribal organizations who are then responsible for allocating half of those funds to tribes in their service areas. Currently, there are over 90 sub-awards and one Component 3 award which funds a tribal organization that serves as the GWIC Program Coordinating Center, which supports peer learning, evaluation, and communication across all Component 1 and Component 2 recipients. We are in our second cycle of GWIC and are continuing to learn from the community on how this program is meeting the needs, supporting strengths to better fit tribal communities as they work to address chronic disease. We intend to share these critical lessons with the rest of CDC as well. The third and final cooperative agreement in the Healthy Tribes portfolio is the Tribal Practices for Wellness in Indian Country, or TIPWIC. TIPWIC focuses on building resilience in a culturally relevant way using a community cultural component to encourage and support tribal practices that build resilience and connections to community, family, and culture. TIPWIC is an innovative, groundbreaking program, really the first of its kind to be supported at CDC. We all know American Indian and Alaska Native people have been using tribal practices as a way of life, unity, connection, strength, and survival for thousands of years. These cultural practices are deep-rooted forms of resilience, and with these teachings come balance, health and wellness for the individual, community, and all living things, including the earth. The aim of TIPWIC is to support and identify these cultural protective factors that reduce risk factors for chronic disease and promote wellness among American Indian people. We've just started a new cycle of TIPWIC and through this program, we'll be working in collaboration with our 36 recipients to help us build an indigenous framework over the course of the five-year cooperative agreement, which we intend to use to guide our future programming efforts. I'm so very privileged to work in a field that addresses health disparities from a holistic perspective, incorporating social and historical determinants of health as a means of advancing health equity. Being able to implement innovative, culturally appropriate approaches that support culture as a means of health and wellness is so incredibly meaningful to me. Not only does this work help establish the scientific credibility for culture as medicine, for culture as health, it allows the communities we serve to define their strengths, their needs, and their solutions. This is ultimately more effective and more sustainable because it just makes sense. It also provides us with, a, with new perspectives and approaches that may not be common or familiar in the Western scientific world, but are applicable in almost any community. As scientists and leaders, 
we have an opportunity and even a responsibility to do things differently, incorporating themes of social justice and indigenous ways of knowing into our framework. In turn, we can make a meaningful difference, and this is how we begin to reclaim our health. I'd like to end with this slide because it seems to epitomize our Healthy Tribes approach. Nothing about us, without us, is for us. We all need to keep this in mind as we tap into the power of community and advance our efforts towards health equity and in any community that we serve. As we build and honor our cultural perpetuity, our responsibility of passing on our cultural knowledge, we know each generation has had it just a bit easier than the one before in many ways. What my great-grandmother experienced was much more horrific than what my grandmother lived through and what we have experienced is likely just a, a bit less traumatic than what our parents experienced. In addition, the ramifications for speaking out and instituting change were much harsher, often fatal for our ancestors, for our great-grandmothers and our parents. As we stand on the shoulders of all those before us, we must remember that our ancestors, our grandparents, and our parents left us with far more than scars. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for your amazing presentation and all of your detail and all of your dedication to being able to serve our Native folks. So I do have a few questions for you. So some of my first question is, how do you talk to your patients about food? I think this is one of the most pivotal things that I discussed in many of my visits. I was that doctor that was an hour, an hour and a half behind all the time. But my, I would go out and, exp and let my patients know, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm running a bit behind, just letting you know if you would like to reschedule, I'm happy to do that. And Almost every single time, patients will say, oh, no, 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 I, I want to wait for Dr. Reese. I know she's probably taking time with someone who needs it because she does that with me, and there are days that my visit will be quick, and so I'm, I'm fine with waiting. Administrators were not as pleased with my, <laughs> my scheduling, but um, a lot of my discussions were really building rapport and talking about lifestyle, behavior, in talking about historical trauma, talking about the why behind chronic disease, and trying to make things simple. I think one of the, um, one of, one of the bits of advice that I have given has try to think about food and eat food that is real, real food. If it wasn't around 100, 200 years ago, you probably don't want to put it in your mouth. If it's fluorescent, you probably don't want to put it in your mouth. If you can't pronounce the words in the ingredients, you might take a minute to think about that. As indigenous people, we've had so many advances in medicine and so many, um, there are so many roots that are used in other fields that were taken from our people and our ways of knowing and so getting to understand those things and reinstilling them in communities is a lot of what I did in my uh, patient visits. And I think people, that resonated more with people. It's difficult to go to a store and, and know how to shop for something that's healthy for your food, for your, for your children and your family, particularly if you're on a particular budget. But making things really simple and having people kind of go back to their roots was uh, a very effective tactic. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that question. And I just have a few more questions. <clears throat> so as you continue down this road and being able to advocate for all of the things and just being able to have some of my conversations with you on the side, again, I'm just so thankful to be able to talk to you about some of this stuff. One of, one of my biggest concerns is always about self-care. So I know you are doing great work. We talked about all of your count, count, countless meetings and always taking time to talk to me. But how do you practice self-care with such a busy schedule and, and being so engaged? My way has been, again, deeply rooted in my 
uh, culture, in Navajo, it's customary to rise early in the morning before the sun comes up and run to east, to the east to greet the holy people. And when you do that, you are then blessed, uh, your way of life, your thoughts, your day, the sun rays come down and bless your environment, bless your home, bless your, um, your day. And so I always begin my day with some form of exercise. I've, I think in my experience, I've been, um, I've been placed in many different environments and oftentimes they were at times that I was likely unprepared for that, even as a, as a kid. And the things that made sense to me were sports. Um, you, you didn't have to speak the same language, you didn't have, the same, have to have the same culture to play sports. And so I've always incorporated activity and movement in my uh, self-care. So I think that would be the one for me. All right, so what kind of sports do you like to play? Oh gosh, well I grew up rodeoing, so I, I love animals and, and competition. I um, came from the, I was a, the starting point guard on the Winter Rock Fighting Scouts High School Basketball State Championship team. <laughs> so, um, of course in Indian country, basketball is big. Basketball is always my passion, volleyball, track. Um, and um, I do CrossFit, I, I'm a, um, avid fan of CrossFit. I, my husband and I started a, essentially a CrossFit gym in my hometown in Fort Defiance, Arizona. And we didn't call it CrossFit because that comes with a big franchise fee that <laughs> you have to sustain and pass on to your customers. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to create a program that was really going to be something that could be sustained by the community itself, even if we ended up leaving the community. And so we brought our equipment there, we started the program, we recruited folks. It, initially, I think we had five people. The program grew, you could Google it, um, MOCT, Maximum Output CrossFit Training, or Cross Training. Um, and it just became a movement in the community. And I just really believe that Native bodies respond to CrossFit. <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, I mean, I'm not trying to um, give props to CrossFit in any kind of endorsement fashion, but um, I definitely like that style of, of um, movement. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, actually starting next year, we're going to have our basketball tournament. So you are going to be on my team, my starting point guard. So, so again, <laughs> thank right. you for that. So again, uh, thank you so much. But before we close, do you have any last last things that, that you would like to share with our amazing group? No, I just want to say thank you. This, this conference has been such an incredible experience. I really feel like I've made so many connections here and there's so much good medicine in this room. You all have the power to make changes that will be incredible for yourselves, for your children, for the future. And remember that quote of standing on the shoulder of, of all your ancestors you are here and you survived and you have an obligation to not perpetuate these cycles, to make these changes and to, to be the change that we need. Awesome, well thank you so much, Doctor. Thank and you. We, we actually ahead. have, we have a small presentation for you. Perfect. Can we give one more hand, of, hand for our, our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Juliana Reese. Again, we want to thank everybody for your time this morning and being so involved and all of your, your continued support. And I also wanted to, I have a few announcements that I, I would like to share before we, we uh, move on. 
So a gentle reminder to, we are still doing evaluation for all of our events for this morning and for this afternoon. So please do us a favor. And if you can complete our evaluation and let us know, we would like to hear some of your thoughts. We would like to hear, hear all of the great information with your evaluations for the keynote and for this morning, when, when they're done, you can leave them here and we will come back and, and pick those items up. And also this afternoon, you will have the opportunity to complete your, your evaluation for all of your, your sessions as well. So you can either do those, I believe there are our paper copies, but we also have, uh, you can use the Whova app. So that'll be a great way for us to continue just to, to stay engaged so you can be able to keep up with that. Also, I wanted to encourage everyone to stay updated on the Whova app as it, it does seem like things are constantly changing. We want to make sure that we can provide the best possible session for you guys. So we've been able to work very hard to make sure that we're keeping all of that information updated. So before you head on to your next, um, your next or your afternoon sessions, please check on those and make sure that everything is updated on that. In addition to that, I do have a few more announcements that I would like to share with everybody. A general reminder that the checkout is at 11 a.m. this morning here at the, the conference. So if you, if you haven't had a chance to be able to uh, do those things, making sure that, that those arrangements are being taken care of. All right. And I have a, a few more things that I would like to share. We have a couple of birthdays here, so I wanted to, some of our staff, were one of the big things through Southern Plains, we're very big on being able to recognize on those things. I don't know if Riley's here, she might be in the back doing some work, uh, being able to stay engaged, but Riley Rader, happy birthday. Thank you for all the things that you continue to do. And can continue to stay engaged on that. So again, happy birthday. Do we have any other birthdays in here? Oh, we got a birthday. Happy birthday, happy 21st birthday over there. Very excited, can't think of a, a better way to be able to spend your day over here. So again, thank you for that. And I do believe, oh, we got a birthday. Charlie Stillwell, Charlie, happy birthday to you. Very exciting thing. So again, we're so thankful that everyone's able to spend your time with us. As we know, we have, have uh, there were several different conferences going on this week and we're very thankful that you've been able to spend, spend your time with us. Yesterday I had a chance to hang out in, in the poster presentation. Man, there was a lot of good information in there. A lot of, a lot of great things to be able to, to keep up with. So, so again, thank you for all those that were able to attend that and be able to continue to stay engaged in, in that. So let's get our, Aaron, are we ready to do some raffles? Oh. Hold on one second, we're gonna make some changes on the fly here, so we're all, always const constantly staying updated. Yep. Yep. All right, as we get those things situated, I also wanted to remind people that we have some breakout room changes, so again, stay engaged on that Whova app to make sure that we're having all of those pieces and keeping all of that information updated. And in addition to that, I also wanted to remind people that this afternoon we will be having our gratitude ceremony. We have able to give away a, a couple of amazing awards, so we'll be having those things this afternoon. And in, the end, in addition to that, we will also be able to uh, provide some more of those raffles. So we are still working very diligently to make sure that we're getting all of those raffles taken care of, getting those things situated, and uh, making sure we're able to provide the best possible uh, conference. So I was just informed that what we're going to do is we are going to take a quick break so that way we can get a, a few things situated. Again, this is an opportunity for you guys to fill up your cup of coffee, check those emails, check on your kids, check on your parents, check on your dogs, all of those things. So we will come back at 11 a.m. So we're going to take a quick 25-minute break. So stretch, do what you need.